I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with you again. This is the China History Podcast. I had this sudden inspiration to feature another great Chinese-American story for this time, and after perusing my list, I settled on either James Hong or Key Luke. So I figured, with the whole Writers Guild and Screen Actors Guild and Aftron strike, why not feature one of the early founding members of SAG? And so I put the great James Hong back on the shelf, and today we're going to give a once-over to a Hollywood legend whose name I have known since the day I started watching TV. Ki Luk, Lu Xi Qi, or Lok Sek Ke in Cantonese, well, kind of, was born on Paul McCartney's birthday, June 18th, in the year 1904. His family ran a retail establishment in downtown Seattle featuring artistic curios, and other Chinese merchandise. The Luke family was already settled in Seattle, and it was actually during a three-year visit to Guangzhou when Ki Luke was born. But by age three, he was living in Seattle. That's where he grew up. We all talked about Seattle not too long ago in that Chinge He episode. Ki Luke developed an early interest and talent in art. He drew cartoons and other kinds of drawings and illustrations, and after an unspectacular academic achievement, in his late teens, young Key Luke began his career as an artist. He hung out in all the various artistic circles around Seattle, and his work was published in a number of Seattle magazines. And this passion for drawing, illustrating, painting, this lasted throughout his lifetime. Key Luke had a true natural talent and had acquired a stellar reputation around town for his artistry. He wanted to go to art school, but his father talked some sense into him and convinced him to study something more practical. So Key Luke studied architecture at the University of Washington, and his college career was cut short after his father passed away suddenly. Key Luke went to work and did the right thing, helping his widowed mother and four siblings. Well, you know how it is. Cream always rises to the top, and his Artistic talents were recognized by a lot of people, and his niche, where he fit in, was an illustrating for the new motion picture industry. Movie theaters were opening up everywhere, and he became in demand for his lobby cards, movie posters, and murals. And in no time at all, in his early 20s, he was quite established in the city of Seattle. It was his work in Seattle that had led Key Luke to Hollywood. In 1927, Tinseltown came calling. They moved down to L.A. and became very much in demand in Hollywood at a time when the industry was really taking off. His first big employer was Fox Film before their 1930 merger with 20th Century Pictures. And he made a name for himself with his illustrations that graced the lobbies of movie theaters. He was a versatile artist, churning out illustrations for the publicity department at RKO Radio Pictures. He was always called in to paint murals for Hollywood sets that required that exotic Chinese look that moviegoers liked so much. The 1933 Fay Ray, Robert Armstrong, and Bruce Cabot version of King Kong, the original one, Key Luke designed and painted a lot of the promo materials for that film. And just the other day, I went to the Chinese theater in Hollywood to go see Oppenheimer in 70mm IMAX. And the inside murals for that fabled movie palace at 6925 Hollywood Boulevard were also painted by Key Luke. He also worked on that amazing ceiling. And even though he had pretty much lived his whole life in Seattle, 
He had the looks that attracted many directors and producers needing a few pointers about their projects, as far as all things China were concerned. He continued to study art in L.A., enrolling in the school that later became Cal Arts. His fame and repute in art circles helped to propel his career upwards. His drawings and illustrations that blended Eastern and Western sensibilities really caught on, not only in America, but in Europe as well. He never had to look for work. Because of all the work he did on the periphery of the film industry, Key Luke was already an insider and known around the studios. In 1934, he was offered a starring role playing as Anna Mae Wong's love interest in another in a long line of China-themed movies that always seemed to feature an Asian damsel in distress and a great white savior of some sort coming to her rescue. That movie never got made, but the casting department got to know Key Luke. He was a good-looking guy, very well-spoken, and a snappy dresser in an age of snappy dressers. He had two all-powerful allies in the queen of Hollywood gossip, Luella Parsons, and her rival, Hedda Hopper. And they carried water for Key Luke for favors he had done for them. The chance to perform as Anna Mae Wong's love interest may have fallen through, but another opportunity dropped out of the sky. MGM cast Key Luke in the 1934 drama The Painted Veil, starring Greta Garbo. Garbo played a wife who accompanied her physician husband to China, and once she arrives in China, she falls in love with another man. Hey, it happens. But Key Luke, he got some face time in the movie with Greta Garbo. He didn't get a credit in the picture, but that was his first big chance. Then came 1935, the year of the pig. If you check Key Luke's IMDb listing, the damn breaks here. And what followed, all the way up until the day he died, were a flood of movie, TV, and theater appearances. In 1935, he was cast as Charlie Chan's number one son, Lee Chan. Charlie Chan was a fictional cop created by novelist and playwright Earl D. Biggers. Charlie Chan worked for the Honolulu Police Department as a detective. And over 50 movies with various actors portraying Charlie Chan, he traveled across America and the world, solving cases wherever he went. And the actors who played Charlie Chan were all Caucasian, except for two who were Japanese. Fifteen of those films featured Warner Oland. What Sean Connery was to James Bond, that's who Warner Oland was to Charlie Chan. There were many others who would go on to portray the portly detective, but Warner Oland is the one most remembered. The first Charlie Chan film came out in 1926. The Painted Veil may have been his breakthrough in the biz, but Key Luke's first real claim to fame in the movie business was his appearance in Charlie Chan in Paris, the sequel to Charlie Chan in London. The combination of Warner Oland's Charlie Chan and his white tropical suits and the and natty-dressed Key Luke as honorable number one son, Lee Chan, took the detective series, already in its seventh picture, to a new level. So with Charlie Chan in Paris, released in January 1935, Key Luke became a household name all over the world, in the markets where the film was shown, that is. So with a winning combination, the next eight Charlie Chan films kept the Warner Olan Key Luke team. And this kept Key Luke well-fed and gainfully employed throughout his 20s. And now in his 30s, he was starting to outgrow that role as Lee Chan. In 1937, Charlie Chan at the Olympics came out, which featured actual footage of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, the one with Hitler and Jesse Owens. And I kid you not, guess who was among the American athletes flying the stars and stripes in front of De Fuhr? That's right, Lee Chan. He was on the U.S. Olympic swim team, and I think he won a medal, too. He wasn't just good at helping his father solve cases, he was also an athlete. So, big star that Key Luke was, he had a similar problem as other international stars of color, like Louis Armstrong. 1930s America was very heavily segregated, and a lot of Hollywood was off-limits to these greats from the era. These years were the apex of the yellow face era of Hollywood, where all the Orientals knew their place. 
Yeah, that's right. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences came out with their directory, showing headshots of everyone and the category of their employment in the biz. And under the uh, colored section, there was Key Luke with the Oriental subcategory. Yeah, and it wasn't any better in the 1940s either. Charlie Chan at the Olympics came out in the same year as The Good Earth, and Key Luke played the elder son in that picture. The pairing of Warner Oland and Key Luke came to an end in 1938 when Oland passed away, aged 58, on a trip back home to his native Sweden. Oland had been suffering from alcoholism for years, and that's what probably ended his life. Key Luke was nothing but positive about Warner Oland. They had a very close friendship, both on and off the screen. You know, even back then, there was a lot of open criticism about all the yellow-facing and racism and portraying Asian people with the whole mid-century box set of stereotypes and tropes. But Key Luke never dumped on Warner Oland, and in his interviews and recollections, kind of portrayed him in a positive light. Sort of like, well, you know, if it had to be this way, at least he was someone who seriously studied Chinese culture and didn't just lip sync. He gave a faithful portrayal of a Mandarin scholar and studied both Chinese culture and Chinese dialogue, Luke had said in 1986. And after Olan's death, Key Luke said that as far as he was concerned, he had been, quote, the only Charlie Chan. And over the years, as the Charlie Chan movies and the characters fell under stronger criticism, he defended his work and the integrity of the films. Despite the negatives, Key Luke insisted that Charlie Chan was always portrayed in a respectful way. And even though he was portrayed by a Caucasian, the character had a wholly positive vibe that reflected well on the Chinese. And Key Luke, he never took any of those Fu Manchu roles or anything that he felt denigrated Asian people. Key Luke appeared in a couple more Charlie Chan films, and anyone watching cartoons on American TV on Sunday mornings in the 1970s might remember The Amazing Chan and The Chan Clan Show. That cartoon came out in 1972 and featured the voice of Key Luke in the role of Charlie Chan. After all, at the age of 68, Key Luke was older than Warner Olan when he died. So this was one of those cartoons that you know, jumped on the Scooby-Doo bandwagon. Velma, Daphne, Shaggy, and Fred, they started their run in 1969, and this genre, like true crime in today's podcasting world, was on fire. And the voice of Key Luke made it to that cartoon as well. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify. ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation? They can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So, make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. Key Luke also played the fictional detective Mr. Wong in Phantom of Chinatown. This was another Asian detective character that appeared in 20 magazine stories and six films. After five pictures with Boris Karloff in the lead role as Mr. Wong, the studio stopped their yellow facing and put Key Luke in the lead role as Detective James Lee Wong. An Asian artist performing in the lead role? You didn't see too much of that in the 1940s. Before Bruce Lee gave America its first look at martial arts greatness in the 1966-67 series The Green Hornet, there was Key Luke. He was the original Kato. In 1940, the series came out. Thirteen action thrill episodes spread out over four hours of action. Kato was the Korean servant of newspaper publisher Britt Reed, and together they teamed up to fight crime. By the time the movie came out, The Green Hornet had already gained a wide audience as a radio drama. 
Key Luke later claimed, although his skills were nothing like Bruce Lee, he was the first one in the biz to introduce the Amerikanskis to karate chops. By the 1940s, if you needed a Chinese face in your production, Key Luke was the number one guy. And if you needed a Japanese or a Korean, yeah, you could cover that too. He was living in West Hollywood, maybe a three-minute walk from the Formosa Cafe. He lived there with a woman named Ethel Davis Blaney, 15 years his senior, and she had two children from a previous marriage. If you were white and married outside your race, that was a big deal back then. I mentioned in more than a couple past CHP episodes that it took till Loving vs. Virginia in 1967 to strike down Virginia's anti-miscegenation laws and put a long overdue end to race-based legal restrictions on marriage in the United States. That was a 9-0 unanimous decision by the uh, Earl Warren court. But back in 1940, Key Luke, in order to marry Ethel, eh, had to bail from California and move to New Mexico, one of the states that didn't have these laws against this kind of thing. In the 1940s, he appeared in 45 pictures, including 1941's Burma Convoy and 1942's A Yank on the Burma Road. I mentioned the Burma Road last time in that Yunnan History Part 5 episode. The Burma Road eh, yielded a few productions out of Hollywood. In the 1950s, with the advent of TV, Key Luke's workload doubled, and it never stopped. He was part of the 1958 cast of the Broadway hit musical Flower Drum Song. In the 1960s, when I became aware of Key Luke, he had appeared on almost every TV show that many of us all know and love. These names are... You know, like a trip down memory lane. General Hospital, Perry Mason, Johnny Quest, I Spy, Dragnet, The Big Valley, Star Trek, Hawaii Five-0, and It Takes a Thief. And he kept it up into the 70s, playing an episode here and there on shows like Marcus Welby, M.D., and Adam-12. But the biggest hit of his career, perhaps, was the TV series that ran from 1972 to 1975. Starring David Carradine as Kwai Chang Kane. I never missed an episode of Kung Fu. David Carradine played a Shaolin monk who's on the run in the American West after he killed the Chinese emperor's nephew. He killed the nephew of the Qing emperor. I'm guessing Xianfeng, Tongzhi, or Guangxu. Kane, according to the story, killed this person in retaliation for killing his own teacher. Anyway, Ki Luke played the unforgettable blind Master Poe with those white contact lenses. He's David Carradine Sifu, and the one who, if you recall, used to refer to his student as Grasshopper. In the Kung Fu series, Master Poe would appear in a number of flashbacks, uttering all manners of words of wisdom to David Carradine. Some of these words came from Confucius, some from the Talmud. <laughs> hey man, that's Hollywood. You know, Key Luke said... This was his favorite role of his career. Key Luke had a famous relative, a cousin, in fact. This was another famous Seattleite named Wing Luke. Residents of Seattle probably have visited or know about the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle Chinatown, a museum of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander art and history. And it was established in 1967 and for over half a century has sponsored exhibits, public events, and youth programs that have done so many positive deeds. Wing Luke, Lu Rongchang, was born outside Guangzhou and was able to get into the United States aged five and ended up in Seattle in 1931. What is there to say about Wing Luke except to say, despite the times he lived in, he went on to excel in school and just as Key Luke showed an interest in the arts, Wing Luke gravitated towards politics. He left high school midway through the year to fight in World War II, seeing action in the Pacific. And Wing Luke arrived back in the States, enrolled at the University of Washington, and continued to exhibit all the same leadership qualities that he had shown in high school. After college, he went on to get his law degree at the University of Washington Law School. And from 1957 until 1962, Wing Luke served as Assistant Attorney General the state of Washington. He was quite an inspiration for the later Washington governor, Gary Locke. In 1962, he went on to serve on the Seattle City Council, becoming the first Asian American to hold elected office in the Pacific Northwest 
as well as the first person of color to serve on the Seattle City Council. In 1960, the two cousins, Key Luke and Wing Luke, attended the Democratic National Convention in L.A. the year Kennedy was nominated. And Key Luke would freely use his star power to assist his cousin, Wing Luke, in any way he could. He even got him backstage at the St. James Theater when Flower Drum Song was on Broadway. But Wing Luke died tragically at the young age of 40 on May 16, 1965, in a plane crash after coming back from a fishing trip up in the Cascade Mountains. He was a beloved figure and had a lot of friends and supporters. Anyway, they all made substantial donations and established the Wing Luke Memorial Foundation. And this is what led to the establishment of the museum. And not long ago, in 2015, the Washington State Attorney General's office set up the Wing Luke Civil Rights Unit to investigate and enforce civil rights and anti-discrimination laws. Into the 1970s, Key Luke appeared in so many familiar TV shows and movies. He was also very much in demand as a voice actor as well. He wasn't credited, but it was his voice spoken by one of the villains in Enter the Dragon. He also did voiceovers for Scooby-Doo, the Smurfs, and Alvin and the Chipmunks. And every big TV show in the 1980s, Key Luke made at least one appearance. There used to be a popular TV sitcom that ran as part of CBS's 1972 fall lineup called Anna and the King. This was a non-musical adaptation of the 1956 film The King and I. And Key Luke appeared as one of the 82 children of the king, played by Yul Brenner, who served as a high-ranking official. And those of you who remember the hit 1984 movie Gremlins, Key Luke played Mr. Wing in that one. And when the sequel came out in 1990, he appeared in that one too. Key Luke's final movie in IMDb listing was as the magical herbalist Dr. Yang in the Woody Allen movie Alice. That came out in 1990. In 1986, at the age of 81, Key Luke was given the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award by the Association of Asian Pacific American Artists. Key Luke died of a stroke aged 86 on January 12, 1991, and was interred at Rose Hills Memorial Park in Whittier, not far from where I'm located. It's one of the largest cemeteries in the U.S. He's in good company there. Many famosas have their final resting place there, including Dr. Hang S. Ngor, who won the 1984 Oscar for his portrayal of Dith Pran in The Killing Fields, Tommy Lasorda, Alvin Ailey Jr., racing legend Mickey Thompson, and anyone alive in the 1960s who followed the Vietnam War, will remember the name Nguyen Gao Ki, the Prime Minister of South Vietnam from 1965 to 67. He was a major figure during the war, and I heard his name constantly on the uh, CBS Evening News. Yeah, he's there too. The gravestone was very simple and just said, Key Luke, 1904 to 1991, in loving memory. The same went for his wife Ethel's matching gravestone that said, Ethel D. Luke. 1889 to 1979, in loving memory. The Washington Post wrote in their obit, quote, Key Luke, 86, a durable actor who was a fixture in the Charlie Chan movies of the 1930s, a perennial television performer, and an oriental sage in Woody Allen's just-released Alice, died of a stroke Saturday in Whittier, California, his agent said yesterday. As the stern dispenser of herbs and wisdom, who serves as a sounding board and informal psychiatrist to Mia Farrow in the title role of Alice, Mr. Luke appeared in his final role to be playing a character with similarities to what audiences might have expected of him in real life. He was a disciplined veteran of the Hollywood scene, inured to the demands of B-movie production. He worked steadily in films and then television, despite his advancing years. The role of wise mentor was one in which he was familiar to modern audiences from his work as Master Po on the series Kung Fu, which ran on television from 1972 to 1975. In all, Mr. Luke played in about 150 films and made dozens of television series appearances as well as playing on Broadway. Mr. Luke's wife died 11 years ago. He lived with a daughter who was with him when he died. End quote. The L.A. Times had written, 
Key Luke, the perpetual Asian-American sidekick in dozens of films over six decades, who will be forever in the public eye as Charlie Chan's number one son in that classic mystery series, has died in a hospital near his Whittier home. It began in a distant era when Hollywood gossip columnists were as powerful as Hollywood studio owners, and Luke managed to attract the favorable attention of both Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper. Luke considered the Chan films harmless entertainment compared to more recent pictures like Year of the Dragon, which he said were demeaning and depicted Asian Americans as mean-spirited. He had said, quote, how can the Charlie Chan character be demeaning when the character was the hero? People respected him. Police departments consulted with him. End quote. He got his star on the Walk of Fame on December 5th, 1990, a year before he died. You could go see it at 7000 Hollywood Boulevard right in front of the historic Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, the oldest continually operating hotel in Los Angeles. Opened in 1927 and was the site of the first Academy Awards ceremony. It's right across the street from the Chinese Theater, a well-deserved prime location given to Key Luke. Let me just finish in mentioning, director Timothy Tao came out with a short film in May of 2012 that won a ton of awards on the film circuit. It's called Key Luke and features him in the afterlife, portrayed by actor Theodore Chin, reminiscing about his life and career. And the narrative is interspersed with shorts from many of Key Luke's performances. I'll have a link to Timothy Tao's film at the show notes. Check it out. Yeah, Key Luke, Lu Xiqi, like Cary Grant. He was a handsome guy to the very end. A suave character, so well-spoken and personable. It's no wonder he was such a beloved person in Tinseltown and among so many appreciative fans around the world. He had quite a life, that's for sure. Okay, that's going to be it. We'll cover James Hong another day. He's still going strong at 94. Just got his star on the Walk of Fame. Oldest artist ever to get one. It's in front of Madame Tussauds at uh, 6931 Hollywood Boulevard. All right, everyone. Chinese history comes in all shapes and sizes. And after those five episodes on Yunnan's history, I thought we could all take a breather and enjoy some lighter fare. To all my new Patreon and CHP Premium prescribers, my deepest thanks for your support of me and this long-running family program. If you'd like to throw a few drachmas in my direction, feel free to go to the website at teacup.media, and you'll find all kinds of ways to show some love. Okay, enough with the panhandling. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the city of Los Angeles, California. Think about coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.